Um, let's begin. So the structure of this um, lecture, first of all, um, I'll give you a couple of definitions of culture and subculture, um, and then we'll talk about some theory. So we'll think about culture in terms of Marxism um, and hegemony, um, um, and then cultural uh, hegemony, um, and then uh, Stuart Hall and the Birmingham um, schools um, ideas of subculture as a form of resistance. Um, then uh, we'll think about how to sort of like categorize a subculture, which is borrowing from the, the reading this week. Um, and then um, we'll have a look at a case study and we'll have a look at um, pirate radio DJs um, and the so, um, as, as, a, as a kind of subculture and as pioneers of subculture, if you like. Um, and then we'll draw a conclusion at the end. Um, so this is a cool topic as well, subculture. Um, actually, I, I'm, I did my undergrad in uh, social and cultural theory, uh, sorry, um, media and culture studies. So um, this is sort of what I did my undergrad in. So for me, this is all the cool stuff. This is all the stuff that I really enjoy um, reading about and teaching as well. Um, so here's a sort of uh, definition. This is taken from the reading this week. If you haven't done the reading, um, it's highly recommended. It's a brilliant reading and it um, it takes you through uh, lots of different ideas of subculture. What I'm not going to talk about in the lecture today and what the reading does talk about is the relationship between uh, subcultural theories and moral panic theory, um, the Chicago School uh, labeling theory, um, and you've all just written essays um, on those topics. Um, so, you know, I'd really recommend doing the reading um, because it will help you draw links between ideas about subculture, um, deviancy, social control, and these other theories that we started at the uh, start of the course. Um, the theories I'm going to talk about um, um, are also uh, sort of touched upon in the reading. Um, uh, but yeah, do, yeah, do the reading. Always do the readings for all of your courses. But um, yeah, it's a really good reading this week, so I recommend doing it. Um, anyway, uh, the the reading is by this uh, person, Hamfler, um, and uh, their definition of subculture is a relatively diffuse social network. Uh, diffuse means sort of like uh, spaced out, if you like. Um, social network having a shared identity. Uh, distinctive meanings around certain ideas, uh, practices and objects, and a sense of marginalization uh, from or resistance to a perceived conventional society. Uh, so uh, we were talking at the beginning about uh, for, uh, different examples of contemporary subcultures. Um, some of the ones that we uh, discussed were um, LGBT, um uh emo goth um one that i hadn't heard of um seen um and andrew tate supporters i yes yeah i guess you know we could call, uh, begin to think of uh tateites as a sort of form of subculture and you could research them as such if if they sort of fit into a similar definition to this uh roadmen and chaps as well so um yeah you know maybe these are all different examples of subcultures and by using this definition and applying it to those subcultures we could begin to um talk about them as sort of subcultures um okay um and also uh yeah just to add as well for your next assignment you'll be asked to do a sort of case study um and think about sort of uh, deviancy and social control as a case study so you know, maybe if you were going to write about a subculture as your case study, you could use this definition to um, to define your subculture. Um, in terms of culture, let's begin with uh, culture more generally. How do we define culture? Um, and this guy, Raymond Williams, um, a very famous academic, he comes up a lot in um, uh, social studies and sort of sociology. Um, he's a Cambridge based academic. Um, publishing around the 70s, um, very, very well respected. Um, but he wrote a, a very uh, famous book called Keywords. 
Um, and all he does in the book is basically uh, take the important words that we use in sociology and social sciences and just defines them and sort of writes about these um, important ideas. Um, on in his entry in the book um, on culture, he begins um, his entry by saying that uh, culture is one of the two or three most complicated words in the English language to define. Um, it's really sort of difficult um, concept. Um, you know, if you think of culture, um, it could include sport, language, fashion, art, um, gestures, uh, body language, um, sort of countryside, um, uh, environment, habitat, um, urban uh, architecture. You know, there's so many different things that we can consider culture to be. So um, it is a very complicated subject. So um, and in terms of thinking of um, social control and deviancy as well, um, this might be one of the problems um, of thinking of social control and deviancy in terms of subcultures um, is that subcultures like cultures are sort of complicated things and uh, possibly uh, quite difficult to define and determine uh, what they are. Um, see how you feel about it, but, you know, just putting that argument out there, first of all, that culture is quite complicated. Um, so Raymond Williams says, you know, culture can include agriculture, um, cultures in the plural. So, you know, we talk about uh, French culture or, um, I don't know, um, Portuguese, um, Peruvian culture um, and uh, sort of indigenous uh, cultures um, and around the world, um, you know, there, there's lots of different cultures. Uh, if you live in a, uh, a city like London or Paris, you might experience multiculturalism um, with a, sort of a, a melting pot of different cultures. Um, but then we also use culture to refer to sort of human civilization or civilized society. Um, and culture can also mean sort of high culture or opera music and um, fine food. Um, you might con conclude that culture is actually everything, you know, um, everything related to human beings is culture, um, which makes it even more of a complicated subject to uh, to talk about. Um, and I've, um, I can't find the definition, but I think it's a really good definition. And I think it's by Adorno and Horkmeyer. Um, and they, they uh, define culture as human knowledge. Um, so that might be another way of sort of talking about culture. But yeah, to get the point across, it's a complicated subject. Um, oh, sorry, just waiting for my slide to load up. Um, but according to Raymond Williams, uh, culture can be uh, sort of determined or defined as a general pro process of intellectual spiritual and aesthetic development, a particular way of life, um, whether of a people, period, a group or humanity in general, or the works and practices of intellectual and especially artistic um, activity. Um, so that's how he uh, defines culture. So that's yeah getting towards sort of uh, thinking about culture and like i say this week we'll look at subculture next week we're looking at youth culture um and we're also going to think about cultural appropriation as well so um it's good to get you thinking about you know what is culture um and culture is um it features in as part of karl marx's uh, theory and there's lots of theories in um by marxists um, neo-Marxists and Marxism as a whole about, uh, you know, what culture is and, and how culture is a, uh, provides a sort of form of social control um, and also a form of liberation as well uh, from uh, social control. Um, but um, one approach, if you like, and one way of thinking about culture, culture um, in Marxist terms is culture could be conceived of as sort of ideology or superstructure. Um, and you've seen this quote before, but just to sort of recap, um, so Marx and Engels had this theory of ideology, and that was the idea that um, the ideas of the ruling classes are in every epoch, the ruling ideas, 
i.e. the class which has the uh, ruling material force in society is at the same time its ruling intellectual force. Um, so if you're sort of a, um, a, a successful business person, um, you could well be sort of rubbing shoulders with um, and influencing the ideas of sort of leading politicians. Maybe you're educated together um, um, and yeah, you, you've got the ability to sort of uh, rule, control and sort of influence society um, and uh, people in lesser positions of power um, of sort of um, um, live their life in, in ways that's determined by this ruling class. Um, an example, Elon Musk, um, net worth 140 billion. Um, he, um, I guess in terms of material assets, I don't know if he's the owner, but he's certainly the CEO at Tesla, um, SpaceX. Um, he's got a number of companies that he, um, um, I guess he sort of joint ownership or, or owns. Um, and one of those companies is uh, was recently became um, Twitter. Um, and, um, you know, he had this sort of strange poll where he asked people, you know, should we reinstate uh, President Trump should be let Trump back on Twitter um, and because a certain amount of people said yes um, he decided you know it'd be a good idea for Donald Trump to uh, rejoin Twitter um, so you know in, in in those terms he's sort of able to influence the ideas of society if you, if you like uh, through his sort of ownership of different companies um, and material assets he's able to sway um, um, the sort of general thinking um, at a global scale as well. He's quite an influence, influential figure. Um, and the sort of ideas he's putting out there, I guess, um, you know, in terms of Tesla being an electric car, you know, there's some degree of environmentalism included there. Um, and um, letting Trump back on uh, Twitter, you know, um, he sort of embraces uh, liberalism or freedom of speech. Um, it might embrace, you know, other things as well. Um, um, but, you know, the, those might be the sort of um, the ideas that he, he um, or the values that he embraces uh, as a, a member of the ruling class. Um, he's able to sort of um, have that um, influence in society. Um, and that gives an example of, you know, Marx's idea of, uh, you know, the ruling class is being able to um, um, sway society or the thinking of society. Some of the drawbacks with uh, this theory of Marx um, and ideology, um, a, a, a frequent sort of criticism is that of agency. So, um, you know, people aren't brainwashed zombies, are they? Just because Elon Musk uh, decides things at a higher level doesn't necessarily mean that we comply. Uh, personally, I left uh, Twitter as soon as he took the company over. So, um, you know, I've got my own agency. I can decide whether I want to go along with things or not. Um, and, you know, as tends to be the case. Um, perhaps some people are more brainwashed than others. Who knows? But um, that, that's a debate there, sort of structure and agency. Um, um, because the ruling class tell people to do something, they don't always comply. Um, for example, feminism, Marxism, or Russians escaping conscription are really good examples of people going against um, the dominant ideas. Um, people from non-ruling classes, um, background, backgrounds um, can also influence society's thinking. I've put an example of Kanye West there, um, but there's, there'll be tons of examples out there. Um, and there's also this idea of social mobility, you know, people can also become members of the ruling class um, from non-ruling class backgrounds, if you like. Um, and if there were a ruling class who can control society's ideas, then why were Marx and Engels able to think otherwise? Why were they able to deviate? Um, and what gave them the sort of ability to tell us all um, that we're being brainwashed, but they're not being brainwashed, if you like. That's another sort of criticism that comes up um, um, in this debate about the ruling class. Um, anyway, I'm giving you Marx and Engels there as a bit of a sort of background story. Um, and, and yeah, before I go on, um, anyone got any sort of like questions um, about sort of ideology, uh, Marx and Engels?
got a snowball effect there. I don't know. Um, uh, and also, sorry, there's no checking code uh, for today's session. Okay, I'll take it. There's no questions. Uh, feel free to ask, ask questions as we go. Um, yeah, so Marx and Engels in the background there, just sort of um, uh, recapping on their theory of ideology. Um, and that brings us nicely on to um, Antonio Gramsci. Um, so I was teaching Italian uh, students last summer um, who came from Antonio Gramsci High School in Italy. Um, he's a very famous um, Italian philosopher, um, um, highly influential in culture studies um, and sort of political science. Um, and his theory is he uh, hegemony or hege um, it's pronounced in different ways, but I always say hegemony. Um, he um, hege I can't pronounce it the other way, but um, hegemony is how I pronounce it. Um, but um, Antonio Gramsci was hugely influenced by Karl Marx and Engels. Um, he was a Marxist um, and the founder of the Italian uh, Communist Party. Um, and he was a, a fierce critic of um, Mussolini um, and sort of uh, Italian right wing fascism um, that was uh, prevalent during and um, just you know, at the start of World War Two. Um, so you had sort of Hitler, Mussolini and Franco in Spain um, and um, under uh, Mussolini's rule, um, Antonio Gramsci with a lot of other Marxists was thrown into prison. He was imprisoned for being a Marxist um, and he sat in prison and sort of wrote and theorized and researched and uh, tried to basically figure out what is going on in Italy um, and he didn't publish any work but after his death um, and I believe it was in the sort of 70s um, someone collected together his um, notes and put out this book called the prison notebooks uh, which is a very popular book um, you can actually buy it in Waterstones um, in, in um, you know in the commercial high street if you like it's quite an accessible book it's fairly easy to read but um yeah it's hugely influential um it's called the prison notebooks um and the key idea that he discusses in this book is hegemony uh, which we'll talk about now um so while sat in prison he was rattling his head thinking to himself um uh, you know, what is going on here? Well, I, um, sort of Karl Marx's theory of um, ideology sort of failed him, if you like. Um, and he was trying to figure out um, why um, Mussolini was so popular in Italy. What, what was it about um, uh, Italian culture and Italian people that enabled Mussolini to rise to power? Um, and Mussolini was sort of carried into uh, Parliament um, on the shoulders of uh, uh, a big crowd of sort of supporters um, 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 and sort of you know, forcibly put into a position of power as a dictator um, and, uh, you know, as a right wing dictator, sort of pushing politics um, that would um, promote um, uh, inequality, if you like. So, um, given that Marx's idea was, and uh, communist idea was more about sort of social equality, why would um, um, ideas of elitism and more power to a select few people um, be a popular idea um, in, in Italy? That's what um, uh, Gramsci was trying to sort of figure out. Uh, why didn't Italians resist fascist ideology? Why did they comply? Um, you know, some, some of the things he was trying to uh, sort of uh, figure out um, in prison. Um, and his theory um, was uh, hegemony. Um, and you might consider this in terms of domination um, or common sense logic. Um, I'll explain a little bit about what that means. Um, so, um, like uh, Karl Marx, uh, Gramsci, you know, considers that there are social elites, there is a ruling class um, and um, Mussolini would have been a member of the uh, Italian ruling class at the time. Um, 
Um, but his idea was that um, unlike uh, Marx and Engels, where um, it's simply just sort of like political ideas that influence people in a society, um, there's a lot more going on. Um, so the ruling class managed to universalize their own class-based interest as everybody's interests. Uh, so for example, teaching woodwork and embroidery at school will help us to build a better society. Um, you know, these are sort of skills taught to uh, working class kids, if you like, um, engendered skills taught to uh, working class kids so that they can uh, become, um, you know, find a job um, in, a, in a company where they're sort of exploited for their skills. But apparently that is going to make society better. It has sort of like um, um, universal uh, um, benefits. Um, or, um, this is my example, teaching maths until we're 18 will make Britain better again. <laughs> um, you know, sort of, um, th these are sort of interests that serve the purposes of those in the ruling class, um, making everyone in Britain uh, good at maths, you know, make, make us all better at computer programming um, and will increase GDP and the economy. Um, but that sort of um, you know, benefits those who own companies um, and employ people um, in more mathematical roles, um, if you like. Um, so these ideas are sort of um, um, naturalized through ideology, um, but then they sort of become embedded within society. And, and there's this sort of like um, common sense logic that um, is in place in society and carries on through generations, if you like. Um, so the ideology informs culture and cultural practices. We start to do ideology in our everyday life. Um, so for Gramsci, uh, culture is at the heart of an ideological str struggle between the so forces of social conservatism and the forces of social change, uh, people that want pro uh, progress, maybe revolution. Um, and ideology is uh, crucial uh, for the maintenance of power for any uh, social group, um, but is the most powerful um, when it is invisible. Um, so when the ideology is invisible, um, it gets bound into common sense practices. Uh, so things just become sort of like logical. Um, so it might have been sort of like just common sense or logical um, not to um, um, not to stop Mussolini rising to power. Um, and, you know, you, if you look at um, sort of Donald Trump and this attack on um, the Capitol in America, you know, a lot of American people uh, may not have resisted because um, they didn't want upsets in the family. Um, Maybe they didn't want to get politically active because they were worried about missing work or upsetting the neighbors or, um, you know, there's sort of like just common sense, everyday things that sort of uh, um, stop us from resisting or, or keep us um, complicit with the system, if you like. Um, ideology becomes common sense, the way things are natural or taken for granted. Examples of, of this um, are, men can't iron uh, because they're not biologically programmed for it. Um, women are naturally better at cooking, um, but not all famous, but not um, being famous uh, chefs, uh, strangely. I always taught that to that uh, to my Italian students about that and asked them, you know, in, in Italian families, is it true that you have a grandmother who has a secret recipe for uh, pasta? And they will say, oh, yes, you know, it's true. Um, um, you know, our grandmothers are amazing cooks and, um, you know, my grandmother's got the best pasta recipe going. Um, and then you talk to them about sort of famous chefs in Italy and they're all men. And you think, well, it's, it's quite strange that, um, yeah, that there's sort of that division, isn't it? Um, another example is, you know, think about the UK, although the royal family aren't that popular, um, Britain needs the royal family for tourism. Um, if you if I go around the classroom um, at university asking students um, about their thoughts and feelings on the royal family, it, it, um, there's that sort of thing that, oh, you know, they're there for tourism or, you know, they're just sort of a part of the framework, part of the fabric of the UK. Um, they're not that bad. Um, 
so maybe that's a really good example then of hegemony you know that's they're just sort of there that's the way things are in the uk um other countries don't have monarchs but we do um and we've sort of learned to live with them if you like um so that might be just how ideology has been embedded within our tradition and within our, our culture um, and therefore we might think about those things in terms of hegemony uh, which is what Gramsci uh, was thinking about um, so in that respect ideas you know Marxist theory of ideology is a bit sort of flimsy um, uh, because it doesn't take into consideration the way things are so ingrained within culture um, so um, yeah, thinking about um, Harry's spare book, I, I watched the interview last night with um, Harry on TV. Um, and, and there's sort of a whole sentiment at the moment in the press of and, and the public, I guess, of, of people sort of um, defending um, the royal family from criticism. Um, uh, and, you know, for us, having a monarchy is sort of uh, normal for us, isn't it? We're sort of, uh, we, we're used to it. Um, and um, it's been a sort of shift, I guess. So, um, people have changed their ideas about Harry. I, you know, he, he seems quite a confused individual, but um, the whole situation um, offers a really good example of how people sort of suddenly jump to defend the status quo and, and, and the way things are. You know, this is just the way it is in Britain. Um, and actually, Harry's perhaps coming off a bit worse for wear. Um, in trying to um, criticise the establishment um, because people sort of draw together, um, pull together to defend um, the establishment, even though it serves, a, um, serves uh, to benefit an elite few and not the greater proportion of society. Um, this sort of just happens, doesn't it? Um, so another example of uh, hegemony, uh, this is from the reading this week as well, um, is the idea the idea that has become normalized to a lot of us um, is the belief that people succeed or fail by, by their own merits in life, um, that the wealthy have earned their riches honestly and the poor simply have not tried hard enough um, and that makes class inequality uh, seem natural. Um, so there you go, I've got a photograph of Andrew Tate there and I think um, you know, he, he really sort of played on this. Andrew Tate was very much about, you know, sort of motivating people to make money and follow me, I'll show you how it's done. Um, um, I, I'd, I'd imagine a lot of his sort of assets and wealth was rented and sort of hired. Um, he was able to um, sort of put on this performance of being a successful businessman. And, and maybe that would have given him some sort of credit um, and some degree of success. Um, but yeah, it was all very much based around this idea that you have to, to work really hard um, and not be lazy uh, to, to make wealth. Um, but, you know, if you look at Donald Trump, for example, um, I can't remember, I think he, he declared publicly that um, it was one million uh, that his father left um, to him. Um, and I think, um, yeah, I, I found a figure of $14 million. So. Um, Donald Trump inherited um, a business or assets of 40 million in value. Um, but, you know, he sort of put himself out there as a self-made businessman. You know, if, it, if you follow me, I'll show you how much wealth you can make. Um, um, but, yeah, it's all, all very much hinged on this idea that um, hard work makes you rich. Um, when actually, um, you know, it's often sort of people's um, assets, you know, family inheritance that gives them a good sort of start in life. Um, I guess some people, you know, do work hard and make it rich. You know, I don't, I don't want to downplay that idea, but um, the general idea, what we're sort of used to and what uh, the assumption is um, that um, hard work makes you rich. So. Um, we can consider that as a sort of embedded um, ideology and a hegemony. Yeah, there you go. Kim Kardashian and uh, sort of state people just don't want to work uh, these days. So, yeah, that's it's very much um, uh, that same idea that, you know, hard work is what gets you on in life, um, not who you married or, um, or, or, you know, what your family background was.
Yeah, he started off with a small loan of a million dollars. Yeah. Um, this is my diagram, this, uh, and this is just because this is how I like to think about um, uh, hegemony. So um, hegemony, uh, you can think of this in terms of ruling ideas, dominant ideology or dominant culture, uh, hegemony. Um, and you can also think about it, and we'll, we'll do in a moment, as mainstream uh, popular culture. Uh, mass culture is another way of um, thinking of hegemony. So it's like the yeah the dominant ideas, the dominant culture, um, and subcultures, which we'll get to later, um, are, are um, uh, subordinate to these dominant ideas, like um, the smaller cultures, um, and often they subvert um, aspects of uh, the dominant culture, and we'll see how that happens in a moment. Um, but yeah, just to give you this idea and, and to get you thinking about the relationship between dominant culture, hegemony, um, and then sort of subcultures as well. Um, any questions at this stage? Okay, um, so part two, cultural uh, hegemony as uh, popular culture. Um, We've got some examples here um, of these might be a bit out of date. So help me out here you, in the comment box. Um, give me an example of contemporary co popular culture. What is pop culture today? Um, so I guess um, icons of pop culture would include um, the Beatles, Beyonce, Tupac, Michael Jackson, Spider-Man, Marilyn Monroe. Um, I don't know who these uh, kids characters are, um, but you've got Simpsons there as well. So um, yeah, popular, um, I guess popular means um, the most, the greater proportion of people um, uh, buy or know about these things. Um, um, you know, a lot, if you ask, if you did a survey, a lot more people would know about the Simpsons than other people. They're sort of um, well-known, uh, popular um, icons. One Direction um, is an example of a British boy band, I guess. Zendaya, Harry Styles. I only learned who Harry Styles was the other day. K-pop, yeah, that's an interesting one, isn't it? Yeah, um, I, I've, yeah, taught before lockdown, I taught a Russian student um, who, um was really into k-pop and had traveled to england to go to a, a korean pop um event um because she was really into k-pop um tiktok influencers that's that's a, yeah that's that's an interesting one isn't it yeah um because i guess these tiktok influencers are only out there for you know a couple of seconds um but um their appeal um, is broad and um, lot, millions, possibly billions of people see these people uh, doing a little dance. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's a good example. Um, lots of authors are becoming more famous through social media like um, Colleen Hoover, oh, who I don't know. Um, I'll have to. I'll, I'll have to. I'm, I'll see. I'm out of date. Um, this is this is where we're going into youth culture, and I'm showing my age here. Um, Harry Potter. Her books are very good, though. Okay. So, okay. I'll have. I'll look that up, Amelia. Okay. Good stuff. Um, so um, we can think about hegemony, um, Gramsci's idea of um, the ruling class ideas being embedded within uh, culture um, as a form of uh, popular culture. And this is um, what became a really uh, prevalent idea um, at Birmingham University in the 70s. And Birmingham U University had um, a center for contemporary cultural studies. And I say had because it was closed down. Um, apparently, it was it was it became a really sort of radical um, base of sort of left left wing um, cultural crit criticism and critique, 
um, so much so that it became sort of dangerous to the government um, and they ended up closing down uh, the, the Cultural Studies Centre at Birmingham University, which if you're into culture studies makes that even more of a cool place to go and study. Um, but um, Stuart Hall was based um, at the um, centre. Um, his theory was that mass culture um, um, offered um, uh, prefabricated, shallow, homogenizing, lowest common denominator cultural forms that pacified people into complacency or even submission, reinforcing um, ruling class ideas or hegemony. Um, ruling class, yeah, hegemony that serves the uh, ruling class. Um, but um, people take and remake cultural texts as a form of resistance. Um, working class uh, subculturalists can uh, consume various elements of pop culture, yes, um, but then they twisted the meanings and subverted them um, in different ways. Um, so, um, yeah, mass culture, if you think about sort of like McDonald's food being unhealthy for you, um, but very popular and easy to access, um, very cheap, low cost, um, or Love Island um, as sort of, um, I guess, male and female bo uh, bimbos, aren't they? A bit sort of like brainless in individuals. Um, but extremely popular sort of uh, television. Um, um, but the argument is these sort of ideas and this sort of entertainment and this sort of cheap, affordable lifestyle pacifies people and makes them less politically active, um, less likely to rebel. Um, and we just sort of go along uh, with with uh, cheap, affordable, popular culture. Um, and it keeps us sort of subordinate uh, to the ruling classes who enjoy a more sophisticated, high-end culture um, because they can afford to do so. Um, but yeah, the idea uh, Stuart Hull and other um, academics at the Birmingham, Birmingham, Birmingham Cultural School had um, was that subcultures um, borrow and appropriate aspects of um, dominant culture um, and use that as part of their subculture. So um, an example that's often drawn upon is punk uh, rockers um, and particularly the Sex Pistols. So um, the Sex Pistols took um, iconic images from uh, hegemony, dominant ideology. So um, the Queen, um, her image um, and also the Union Jack um, and sort of defaced uh, these images. Um, the Sex Pistols put out a, um, a, a famous song, I think it reached uh, number one in the UK as well, and the song was called God Save the Queen. Um, um, so they'd taken sort of uh, the imagery um, from the Queen and um, from the monarchy and used it uh, to market their product. Um, and even when they're performing on stage, they've sort of got, uh, you know, Union Jack um, on stage. So they were borrowing from uh, the ideas of national ideas of popular culture and hegemony, um, but sort of twisting and subverting them. Um, um, here's the lyrics for God Save the Queen. Uh, so God Save the Queen, the fascist reg regime, uh, they made you a moron, um, a potential H-bomb. Uh, God save the Queen, uh, she's not a human being and there's no future and England's dreaming is sort of the opening lyrics of the song. So, um, yeah, sort of getting across their own sort of political ideas um, through the appropriation and subversion of, of mainstream ideas. Um, um, and, you know, the, the Sex Pistols were anarchists. That was their sort of political ideology. Actually, he's, uh, the lead singer here has got a picture of Karl Marx on his uh, jacket there. So perhaps um, Marxist slashed anarchists. Um, but then he's also got a sort of subverted, um, I, I believe, a, a Nazi emblem on his, his jacket there as well. So um, a lot going on there. But so, yeah hopefully getting the point across that there's sort of a borrowing and an appropriation and subversion of um, the symbols and icons of mass and mainstream dominant hegemony uh, within uh, popular culture, uh, within subculture. 
Um, so subcultures tend to offer either passively or actively some sort of resistance to mainstream um, dominant or hegemonic culture. So they're deviant in that, that respect to social control. Uh, scholars um, hotly debated the importance of resistance to varying degrees. Subcultures foster an oppositional consciousness or even an intentionally antagonistic relationship with normal society. Um, so subcultures want to be, want to stand out and want to be defiant, uh, rebellious. Subculturalists band together based on shared uh, set of values or beliefs and destiny, resist or stray from those commonly held by the mainstream culture overall. So these are quotes taken from the reading this week. I'm going to have to speed up because uh, we're getting towards the end of the lecture. Um, um, there, there is this sort of um, wild card, if you like, or um, so this comes from the reading this week as, as well. So men's fraternal organizations such as the Elks or Lions in the US, um, um, in the, I forgot what these guys are called, uh, you might be able to help me there. Um, there's Boris Johnson's and um, David Cameron was a member. I think, you know, this is the Eton uh, fraternity group. I've forgotten the name. Um, um, but, you know, they, they are sort of unconventional, if you like, and um, they're slightly rebellious um, in elite circles. Uh, so do we consider their um, resistance as a form of subculture? Um, if so, that makes things difficult because they uh, clearly don't serve uh, the interests of wider society. Um, you know, they're still sort of in the elite circles, if you like, um, but, you know, Possibly they are too a subculture. Um, yeah, Bullingdon Club, that's the one. Um, okay, I'll jump over this bit. I uh, just want to get to um, do a bit of a case study uh, before we close. So getting towards your second um, um, assessment, you'll be asked to do a case study and I'll just uh, offer a, a sort of uh, a bit of a case study before we close. Um, so thinking about pirate radio DJs as a form of subculture and also sort of promoters of subculture. Um, so being a pirate radio DJ is illegal um, and anyone involved in illegal broadcasting uh, is committing a criminal offence and could face up to two years of imprisonment and uh, an unlimited fine or both. Um, however, um, yeah let's think about pirate radio djs as a subculture and also yeah like i say people who promote subcultures so pirate radio play play to and influence crowds of people um and push ideas um and music that sort of encourages um subculture as well um so in the uk in 1922 uh, radio uh, was invented um, and the first radio station was uh, the BBC, the British Broadcasting uh, Company. Um, yeah, established in 1922. Um, it's the first and oldest national broadcaster worldwide. Um, and it was established uh, under the Royal Charter. So the monarchy, um, you know, uh, sort of funded um, and granted um, and licensed the BBC as an illegal uh, national broadcasting service. Um, it's a public institution and therefore provides a service um, and is funded uh, by television license fees. And the BBC held a monopoly uh, on radio broadcasting from 1922 until 1973. So uh, it was able to um, promote um, uh, core ideas um, that were sort of unchallenged, if you like, uh, because they uh, controlled the airways. Um, the focus was mainly on sort of things like war coverage, uh, propaganda, religion um, and education. Um, they promoted sort of Christian British uh, values uh, through their broadcasting service. Um, and BBC, the BBC, the tradition of the BBC offers a really good example of sort of ideology and hegemony as well, sort of the core British values uh, that they promoted and embedded within the uh, cultural fabric of the UK 
um, is a really good example. And um, watch the movie the, Queen, the King's Speech, especially if you want a sort of a flavour for what the BBC was like. Um, radio Caroline um, was one of the uh, many pirate radio stations that uh, sort of challenged the convention of the BBC and, and therefore sort of offered a, a deviant uh, alternative uh, to uh, the mainstream BBC. Um, it was on board a ship uh, that sailed around the coast of uh, the, the UK um, and as a, as a result of doing this, uh, they could avoid uh, national jurisdiction. So they couldn't uh, be fined or caught by British law because they were in waters that were outside of UK uh, jurisdiction. So um, they often an alternative to the BBC's uh, broadcasting monopoly um, and also avoided record companies, politics um, and their control over popular music as well. So it was a rebellious station full of deviants. Um, the BBC uh, sort of bans rock and roll music on the radio, uh, certain songs, um, whereas Radio Caroline would play and promote this uh, illegal music. Um, and looking back, you know, it's quite, quite today quite tame sort of artists like uh, Scylla Black, for example, or um, Roy Orbison, um, which, you know, is today's standards quite tame music, but back then they, they, those were quite rebellious sounds. Um, the music by, played by the BC, BBC was considered quite conventional, um, whereas Radio Caroline was considered loud, uh, rebellious. Um, and this was all during the um, era of the Beatles hysteria. Um, people worried about their, their you know, sort of young daughters being, um, um, uh, yeah, sort of swept away by this hysteria um, and this pandemonium uh, about the Beatle, the Beatles. Um, and also, you know, this is during a time of the, the mods and the rockers as well. And we've seen sort of Stanley Cohen's work on moral panic. Um, um, so the British government wanted to control youth culture um, that undermined uh, traditional British values or hegemony um, and pirate radio uh, was going against that. Um, there's more contemporary examples um, as KISS FM, which today is a commercial station, um, but it started out broadcasting from bedrooms and living rooms in the, in the mid 80s. Um, it broadcast from South London to uh, Greater London um, but now it's a sort of national uh, radio network. Um, in the early 80s, when it came about, uh, um, it would promote illegal raves um, and sort of founded uh, the UK acid house music scene, uh, which made it through eventually into mainstream popular culture, um, but started out very much as a subculture. Um, early DJs included uh, Norman Jay, um, Trevor Nelson, uh, Tim Westwood, um, and the DJs, as well as the station, became sort of national uh, success stories. So Norman Jay was um, awarded an MBE, um, a member of the most excellent order of the British Empire. Um, and he came to prominence for playing um, at illegal warehouse parties in the 80s. Um, and the rave scene was a whole sort of subcultural movement that actually made it mainstream in the end. Um, he was awarded an MBE for services uh, to music in 2002 by, you know, sort of the Queen of England. Uh, same with Trevor Nelson, um, who moved to BBC Radio One from Pirate Radio in '97. Um, also made it through to sort of uh, One Extra. Now he's on Radio Two, has award been awarded prizes as well. Um, as Tim Westwood, who's sort of, you know, been sort of did discredited recently. Um, but, you know, uh, undeniably, um, you know, it was a sort of a huge success um, and came from a sort of pirate radio uh, background, um, but really influenced the UK in terms of hip hop and rap culture. Um, yeah, so um, like Radio Caroline, these guys uh, started on pirate radio stations promoting subculture um, which then sort of made it through into the mainstream and the radio stations themselves too becoming commercial successes. Um, Rinse FM um, um, would be another example um, uh, that we could look at, but we're running out of time. Um, so I'm going to try and get through to the 
Yeah. Um, so can we think of radio, pirate radio as a subculture? Yes, we can. So first of all, um, according to this definition from the reading this week, um, there's a diff diffuse network or connections between people engaged in ongoing interaction. So yeah, there's uh, radio technologies, transmitters um, that transmit music from DJs to audiences. Are there shared identities? Uh, do people see themselves as different from others? Yeah, um, they were rebellious, non-conformists. They went against sort of traditional conservative values in the government, um, and they were illegal um, by law, um, engaged in criminal activities. Um, they shared uh, distinct meanings, shared ideas, practices, and ob objects. Um, so yeah, the sort of shared equipment, musical tastes, uh, dance, dances and ideas, um, for example, uh, liberal American ideas or Afro-Caribbean culture, um, resistance to some form of um, mainstream dominant or hegemonic um, culture. Yeah. So yes, there's sort of the resistance to the BBC, uh, commercial mainstream radio and government control and a resistance to sort of like uh, traditional British values, Christian values and uh, hegemony. Um, and a marginalization to um yeah you know the, these pirate radio broadcasters were um broadcasting from boats uh, bedrooms living rooms and promoting deep uh, gigs and events in warehouses and unconventional spaces um in in urban places so um very, very much sort of um marginalized or set apart from um normal conventional society um Yeah, the next two slides, um, we're going to sort of look at some of the um, common practices that uh, uh, subcultures offer. So specialized vocabulary and, and, and language. Um, so like rock and roll um, of the 60s, um, the grime music promoted on Kiss FM came with its own style, its own fashion, um, and its own sort of uh, language. Um, so that's another way of sort of defining subcultures as well as through the sort of language that's used. So I'll, I'll end on this. Um, when I'm in the bathtub, I look at the bubbles in the bathtub sometimes, um, and uh, some bubbles are bigger than smaller bubbles. Um, and sometimes the smaller bubbles sort of pop and join up with the bigger bubbles, if you like. Um, and that's how, you know, I like to think about the relationship between hegemony and subcultures. Hegemony is like the big bubbles and subcultures are like the small bubbles. But when the small bubbles pop, they sort of join up with the big bubbles. And um, that's what is key in the reading this week for me is that, um, like Hamfler suggests, subcultures has a, have a transformative potential. So subcultures are sort of marginal cultures that can influence um, and change um, dominant ideas in society. And I think we've seen that with hip hop culture, seen that with rock and roll culture, and possibly LGBT um, and other cultures that have sort of changed the way general society thinks. Um, so as subcultures age, they carry some form of subcultural ideas and practices with them. Subcultural identities often resonate into as adulthood, and many of those adults go on to, uh, to shape other social institutions, becoming teachers, business people, artists and musicians, even politicians. They get jobs, vote, and have the children of their own. In short, subcultures impact our lo larger social world. So, um, what may seem as a sort of like a marginal subculture today um, may go on to influence society in the future or not. You know, maybe subcultures sort of um, don't make it into the mainstream, sort of uh, exist and perish in a, a subcultural state, if you like. Um, so uh, thank you for coming today. Um, in conclusion, um, Gramsci offers a theory of hegemony or dominant culture um, which can be conceived of as a form of social control. Uh, subcultures uh, could be considered as deviant to popular culture, twisting and subverting symbols of the dominant culture to serve their own sort of political purposes. 
um, subcultures deviate from dominant culture, but members can also deviate from the rules of subcultures too. Um, something to consider. Um, subcultures can be defined and categorized according to networks, identities, meanings, resistance, marginalization, language, and styles. Subcultures can influence and shape popular culture, laws, moral norms, and politics too. Um, so that's it. That's it from me. Um, any questions uh, before I leave today? Thanks, Maylene. Cheers, Elliot. Good to see you. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, Joshua. I don't. I didn't realise you had your hand up. Um, let me know if you've got a question. I'm happy to answer. Cheers, Dom. Have a good day. How, yeah, that's a good question, Mina. Um, how 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 are TikTok? How do TikTok influencers um, influence or advantage ruling class ideas? I, I guess they do. To me, TikTok influencers sort of are the epitome of passiveness, aren't they? They're sort of um, almost sort of contained in a box. Um, yeah, that, that's a really good question, and and. Yeah, yeah, that is a good question. I, I guess uh, thinking about hip hop as well, you know, it's sort of um, it claim it came about as a sort of, um, and I guess this is yeah, this is a, a key sort of thing here is that hip hop came about as a sort of rebellious anti-establishment music, um, but a lot of the music that made it through into the mainstream sort of served the interests of. Uh, possibly patriarchy um, and capitalism too. So it was sort of like the gangster rap, if you like, that made it through to the mainstream eventually, much more so than the sort of conscious hip hop, Public Enemy or um, KRS One. It was much more sort of um, the 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 liquided down uh, um, commercial um, um, hip hop that made it through, and and the company record companies themselves sort of imitate try to employ people that would imitate the sound of um successful artists or subcultural artists so um the industry sort of um you know has a has a way of sort of borrowing from subcultures and replicating the sound um, and that was really done with punk music as well you've got sort of shaken stevens who was a sort of a softer version of elvis presley um so uh you know the, the sort of an element of that um but yeah that, that's interesting i don't know with tiktok influencers i do agree with you that they sort of um very passive and perhaps um serve the advantage of ruling class ideas um but maybe you know that maybe that would just make for a really good study um um because you know this isn't set in stone the theory of subcultures um um has lots of sort of drawbacks and maybe that w might be one drawback is that a subculture may not be politically active um it may be a, a quite a passive um, um non-political apolitical um activity um but yeah um it might need a bit of consideration but that's a, that's a good example and it gets a good conversation good in, going as well yeah by keeping you in the mist um they used uh, to implicitly promote capitalist values there. It's an interesting thing. Yeah, yeah, there you go, yeah. And I guess there has to be some sort of content on TikTok as well, isn't it? They, they, um, how do you say that? Like, yeah, uh, yeah I'd, 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 I'd have to go and sort of rattle my head about that one. Um, may, maybe you maybe TikTokers are, are not a good example of a subculture because they're apolitical. Um, so, you know, maybe if you were discussing that, you'd have to sort of take that approach to it and, you know, have a bit of a debate about whether they're uh, political or apolitical. And if they are apolitical, then do they, are, are they comparable to other subcultures that are political, if you see what I mean? Um, or maybe their politics is, uh, passive 
maybe they're sort of promote passiveness and that is a sort of politics compliance is a sort of politics isn't it so um um yeah food for thought there you go um have a lovely day um and uh yeah we'll talk about that in class no doubt bye